Uh, so I, I'm really happy to be speaking to you today on multiparametric um, prostate MRI, which has truly been a game changer in prostate imaging. I've been doing prostate imaging since the 90s. And back then, uh, we were kind of laughed at, and there were a lot of problems with it. But with the advent of better imaging, in particular with diffusion-weighted imaging, there's been a significant contribution to patient care. And just from the outset, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, without which we could never have made this kind of progress. So prostate cancer affects a large number of men. It is an unpredictable disease in that it can be a very benign and indolent disease versus aggressive and lethal. In fact, when it's metastatic, it is incurable. There are so, so many management options that patients are just absolutely confused with surgery, external beam radiation, brachytherapy, focal treatments such as laser and HIFU, immunotherapies, chemotherapies, hormonal manipulations. And then newly is the opportunity for low-grade disease to be managed with active surveillance. But all of the invasive treatments that are supposed to go for cure have an adverse impact on the quality of life with incontinence, impotence, and if you're undergoing hormonal therapy, very, very difficult uh, physical challenges to face. In the traditional diagnostic workup, one would have a suspected prostate cancer by virtue of a positive PSA or a positive digital rectal exam. Now, the latter, the positive digital rectal exam, is very insensitive, and usually it's a little too late by the time you've found it there. In the traditional mode, that suspicion would trigger a truss, a, a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. And as long as the individual was biopsy negative, they were just trapped in the cycle of the unknown. Meanwhile, with every biopsy, there's a certain amount of risk due to the sepsis, hospital admission, and up to 27% with adverse events. The only way to escape that is when there was a positive biopsy. Then you go to your pre-treatment evaluation and a management decision. Is it going to be definitive therapy, active surveillance, and which definitive therapy? In the modern era, there's new options. So same situation. If we suspect prostate cancer by virtue of the positive PSA or DRE, we now have an option to go right to the multiparametric MRI. And some practices now, if there's nothing that is PIRADS uh, significant, that is uh, many, many places in which it's 3, 4, and 5, they might go on, but more and more practices are looking at PIRADS 3 as something that can be watched, depending on the size of that particular uh, suspicious lesion. And if they do go into active surveillance, um, we're monitoring that right now to see if there's any adverse impact on the longevity of the individual, and it doesn't seem that way. But same deal, if it's, if it's uh, positive, then we go with an MR-guided biopsy, ideally transrectal fused or the in-bore. And this has been giving us a much higher yield of clinically significant cancers and a lower yield of clinically insignificant cancers. So these are new options and these are uh, good options for patients and this has been some of the positive evolution that we've seen. Uh, hello, this is uh, Sean Williamson. Um, thanks again for participating in this course. Uh, basically, what's new in, in prostate cancer pathology? Again, I have no disclosures relevant to this topic, and, um, and let's get started. So why does this matter? Um, you know, what's going on in, in, pro in, in prostate cancer pathology? What's been changing? Well, grading and reporting of prostate cancer have been refined several times over recent years, and hopefully with the aim of improving patient care and prognostication. Uh, but there still remain quite a few areas of debate, even among experts. Luckily, most of these are in sort of targeted, uh, fairly infrequent areas, but we'll sort of go through and cover most of those today. And so what I'll try to do is indicate how I handle those areas of disagreement in practice uh, and, and some options that you can use um, to resolve these, these challenges. So when we talk about the uh, elephant in the room with you know, sort of hot topics or emerging topics in prostate cancer pathology, the uh, elephant in the room is, is certainly intraductal carcinoma of the prostate, which has gained a lot of attention and controversy recently. So what is introductal carcinoma? It's basically a proliferation of carcinoma cells that's filling pre-existing glandular spaces. Um, the classic pattern for introductal carcinoma is cribriform, but there are several patterns, which I'll show here. 
And typically, intraductal carcinoma is associated with high-grade invasive cancer. So the importance of it is that uh, you almost always have concurrent high-grade invasive cancer. And by high-grade, I mean at least uh, a component of pattern four, uh, often pre uh, a predominant pattern four cancer. While I go through this, there are some handy references if you'd like to look at them. Um, and so these should be in your handout if you'd like to look them up later. Um, uh, several review articles that were recently published talking about the differential diagnosis of large duct lesions and uh, introductal carcinoma of the prostate in particular. So here's kind of a classic example of introductal carcinoma. You can see a cribriform gland here, and then almost all around it, there are those smaller uh, nuclei, those small dark flat nuclei, which almost certainly correspond to the normal basal cell layer of the, of the gland, which has been overrun by this cribriform process. And then in this field, you can also see all around the edges, there are uh, invasive cancer glands. Uh, here's an example of introductive carcinoma, which is actually more, more flat rather than cribriform. And so if you have this gland in isolation, um, I think you would be hard pressed to call that introductal carcinoma. However, in this field, since you have the invasive high-grade cancer all around it, and, and you can make out the prominent basal cells in this, uh, this gland with the very atypical uh, lining cells, I think to me that is an example of introductal carcinoma. Although if you had that by itself in a biopsy, uh, it, I think it would be difficult to be sure that that's introductal cancer and not say high-grade PIN, uh, which, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, sort of an approach for how to, uh, how to handle that. And here's an example actually, which basically looks solid, um, not much cribriforming, but basically a solid proliferation filling a pre-existing glandular space. And again, I don't have uh, basal cell immunistic chemistry on this particular one, but you can see that there's that very dark uh, lining layer of likely pre-existing basal cells around the periphery of this, this solid gland. Uh, this example has sort of prominent papillary formations and a little bit of cribriforming at the top of the field. Um, so if you were following strict criteria for diagnosis of introductal carcinoma, this may not have the extensive cribriforming that's usually required. Uh, but to me, I think this is again an example of introductal carcinoma when you consider the uh, marked atypia in this gland and the similarity of the cells filling this pre-existing gland to the uh, adjacent invasive cancer.